So how do we know if our model is valid? I mean, you can have an amazing R square, R and R squared, like a correlation of one, but what does that mean? Well, there are a couple things that can influence it. Uh, one is a thing called influential points. And a point is considered influential if removing it significantly changes the regression line. So right here is the regression when I remove this point. And just to remind you, if you look at your uh, beginning of your notes, um, you should see that the old regression was this one right here. And so the line changes a bit drastically. First of all, the slope of the line is lower. When I have that point in, the slope of the line is 0.52. When I take out that point, the slope changes to 0.35. Now you might argue, um, and, and you can also see what, see how that point is pulling up the line here. And when I take it out, the line snaps down to these other points. So I would consider this an influential point. All right, oops, didn't need to do that. All right, how did Pearson's correlation coefficient change? Well, in this case, when I take the point out, I know this is the original and it's on the right. It went from 0 0.9262, really 0.93, to 0.95. That's probably not a huge change, but it is a change. Um, I would argue looking at the slope and the intercept is a much bigger deal. So figuring out which point is going to do, make the biggest difference is um, part of finding an influential point. Usually most influential points are kind of far from the center. They tend to be because if it's in the center, it's it, you know from the average X and the average Y. There's your values. All right, now you should always, sometimes if you have an influential point, always look at the scatter plot. Make sure you don't have a data recording or data collection error because that can easily happen as well. Now, um, we actually have some data from a high, a high school stats teacher who um, gathered GPAs for students and also asked them, how many hours do you spend playing video games? And I have the feeling it's over a week that he did that. If you have the notes, you have all the, 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 the data table. But we here I have a scatter plot of that data and I ran a linear regression of that data in the table and here's my output. So the least squares regression line, I'm going to use A and B, is uh, I could say y equals negative 0.678x plus 91.5, but it's always better if you can make it in context. It's take the number of hours, multiply by that, and add 91.5 to get the GPA. Now, how do we interpret this negative 0.67? Really, I have 0.67, it's really negative 0.68. Well, for every extra hour of gaming, we expect the GPA to de decrease about 0 0.67, 0 0.68 points. So the this is the marginal change. Remember, we kind of went over that already. The slope is the marginal change, and it lets us know how much something changes. Describe the strength and direction of the linear regression. Well, in this case, the direction is obviously negative. My correlation coefficient is negative 0.58. Well, between 0.5 and 0.8, or negative 0.5 and negative 0.8, we consider that moderate strength, and it's definitely negative. What percent of the variability is explained by the linear model? Well, R squared is 0.34, so 34% of the variability is explained, which means, hmm, this is, okay, it's kind of a, um, it explains part of the, the GPA, how many hours you play on video games. But you can still be a good student and play quite a few hours. But it does have a trend. All right, what grade would you predict for a student who plays video games for eight hours? Well, we'll just take that equation we had before and substitute eight, and we get 86.08. Now, residuals are the difference between actual and predicted. So you want to write down residual equals y, and I should say actual y minus predicted y, not the x. These are only y. So this is the y here um, of the actual data point minus the predicted data point. We always have to give you the data for the actual, and there's a reason I have this data here. You can see here's an actual. 
uh, data point for the student who plays video games for eight hours. So let me go ahead and calculate the predicted. The predicted with the hat is always from your equation. And we just did that in the last uh, screen. It's 86.08. The actual is this 80 right here. So we have 80 minus 86.08, negative 6.08. So that's my residual. By the way, when the residual is negative, was the actual above or below my prediction? It was actually below. So the residual tells you where your um, actual is compared to your predicted. Because people want to do predicted compared to actual and they tend to uh, switch them. So when the residual is negative, the model over predicts. When it's positive, it under predicts. Now, one of the key things we do with residuals is we want to check the validity of the regression if it's really linear. And here are two plots of residuals. And the basic story is no pattern is good because that means they're kind of scattered evenly along the line. Here, you definitely see a curved pattern, which implies, hmm, maybe it's not a straight line. So no pattern, good, pattern, bad. Got it? So I can go ahead and use a linear regression for this video game data, but for this other set of data that I have here, I should not use a linear regression. Now, I do also want to make sure that you can read a computer printout. This is a very typical format for a computer printout, and most of the stuff you're looking for is right here. So um, if I'm writing down the equation, I know they have it here already. Weight is 6.1376. And the reason I know that is, well, it says wait. And I know that the second line here, that's my x variable. So height is my x variable. And then this constant is always your y-intercept, minus 266.53. Now, they want me to interpret this number. Well, this is marginal change. So however, every time height changes by one unit, weight's going to change by that many units. So we expect the weight to increase by 6.1376 units for every unit increase in height. How would I describe the strength of the correlation? You're probably going, I don't see an R. And you don't. But I do see an R squared. And R squared is 0.897, so R must be the square root of that. R is 0.947, so it's quite strong. Now, last but not least, one of the main things we want to make sure you learn in stats is that correlation does not mean causation. And one of my students shared with me this wonderful website, tylervingen.com. I even bought the book. And here's an interesting graph. He has cheese consumption from 2000 to 2009 versus total revenue from the golf course. So I actually went and I looked up the data from his website and I put it in and I did a linear regression. And here's the equation, um, 14, 15 times cheese consumption minus this amount gives me golf revenue in millions. Well, do you really think that cheese consumption determines golf revenue? Hopefully not. There has to be another factor. And actually what Tyler Vingen uh, does, he doesn't display this linear regression. He di displays a time series, which is actually quite helpful for us because we can think, all right, what's going on here? Well, in 2001, you know, we had 9-11, and our economy was not doing so hot. We already had some issues to begin with, but it was coming up, and then it got kind of settled down. I guess we were still eating cheese after 2011. And then the economy's getting better, and we're like, yeah, let's get some cheese. And then the housing boom, uh, housing crash happened around 2009, and the economy started to tank again. Well, it's not that cheese predicts golf. It's just both are predicted by the economy. And I guess in this case, time is a predictor. But I actually probably would change that to economy. Either one of those I would probably take because it's the time that's affecting it or the economy that's affecting it, not cheese predicts golf.